Hi, everybody. This is uh, Wade and Thomas with the Setter Tales podcast, and we welcome you to another episode uh, this evening. And uh, this is kind of a cool, cool, cool night because we've been building to this for, for quite a while. And uh, I would be remiss if I didn't mention real quickly, because we talked about this last time, that the only way this is possible for us to be doing this uh, is with our, uh, my son, Will, who's our engineer and producer and our technical technical guy and uh yeah without his uh his uh, work and and expertise we would be uh wouldn't be here talking to you all so uh thank you a lot will for everything you do and what you've uh, put into this show um the other thing is uh that we really appreciate all the support that you've given us after our initial podcast a couple weeks ago and so we appreciate you people everyone that's uh you know watched and all of you out there that are listening tonight and uh, uh we're going to have a guest that's going to join us here shortly and that's going to be uh that's going to be pretty neat and so uh what do you think about where we're going to go i'm excited about this um it's been kind of in the works for a long time or quite a while and and i talked to our guest a few times on facebook messenger and texting back and forth so i'm um, pretty excited and i'd like to also thank everybody for reaching out so far and and again will um he has been you know the mastermind of this whole deal so i know he has a button back there <laughs> that probably does a round of applause we should test him and see if he can find it real quick yeah he's got a lot of magic things back there i don't think he's there. gonna do it though no, i don't think he's gonna do it either <laughs> so he whispers in our ear once in a yeah while, so he, he tells enough. us what to do and and uh well, I think what we'll do is we'll get right with it, and I'm going to have you uh, kind of introduce this uh, this guest uh, tonight, and we'll let him kind of take off and, and go for it. Yeah, so tonight's guest is is Brett Wanicott, and, and uh, I ran into him on some of the setter pages on Facebook and saw that the, he had written this book. So, And uh, I try to read maybe one book a year, and it's got to be really interesting. So... I went right on Amazon, ordered this, and uh, I read it in about a day and a half, two days. So I sat down. It was pretty captivating. It kind of catches you with the initial yeah. story and then nails you at the end, too. So it keeps you going. And and I think one time I sat and read and read and read, and I'm like, I've been sitting here for three hours. And it's a page turner. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's a great book. And from what I've seen online, he's having great success with it. So yeah, I'm, I'm happy to get him on the show here. And and pop him up on the screen and and really get to uh there he is. really get to going into this so we uh we welcome you brett and and you know we uh can just kind of tell us about what you're doing now um we know you have setters so we want to hear about them as well <laughs> well it's good to be here thanks for having me on um i'm just a, a hunter from utah who's really into this stuff so uh, I don't know what you want me to tell uh, about myself. That's kind of a hard, that's kind of a challenging thing to sit and, well, and say, it is. well you know, <laughs> I'm this, but. Uh, <laughs> well, we all, uh, we all, yeah. we all had our first experience, uh, you know, with, with gun dogs and bird hunting and as you, as you did. And so we'd kind of like to know what that was for you, what that experience was and where that has led you, I guess, over the years to where you are right now. Yeah. So, so I grew up hunting with my, with my dads and sorry about the picture guys. Um, and, um, my parents were divorced when I was very young. And so my dad, he had uh, German short haired pointers and my stepdad, he was a duck hunter. And so I kind of got this, um, this double whammy of, of hunting from, from my stepdad and my, and my dad. And, um, you know, I remember the first time I saw a dog point, like, you know, from the eyes of a child, like it was yesterday. Um, of course it was a German short hair and, uh, I, I was just a little kid. It was bigger than I was. And, um, it, it really didn't seem like that big a deal when the dog stopped and pointed, but, uh, when the bird got up and, and all the, all the things that go on, you know, so fast. And for the first time, it was really quite startling to me at first. But um, then it, be, I mean, it became really cool, really fast, and guns went bang, and it, it just so much stuff happened. And then the dog brought a, you know, a rooster back through the grass, and I still remember, you know, seeing the bird in the dog's mouth, and and it, you know, it took it to my dad's hand, and I don't think it was all that willing to give it up right away, if I remember right. But it did give it up, and uh, but anyway, the, the, and he was showing me the bird, and it was just just a really cool experience. Um, and I, I don't remember ever not being 
not going hunting. Um, so as, as I grew up, of course, my first dogs were, were, um, short hairs that, uh, you know, that dad put me, uh, with, or, I mean, he had an old dog that he let me kind of wander off by myself and learn some things with. And, and then he, you know, he gave me a pup out of one of his litters when I was mm, probably 15. And that was my first dog that I tried to train, um, she taught me some things. I don't know that I ever managed to teach her anything. Uh, and then, um, you know, as, as I got older and, and left home, um, as soon as I found myself in a, in a place for a, a dog, I, I got a dog and I, I picked up a Brittany is, is what I bought, a Brittany named Bo. And he was, he, uh, if I'm honest, he taught me everything I know <laughs> about hunting birds. He was really quite, uh, I, I didn't have electricity. I, you know, I was scrounging money together uh, to, buy a bag of old Roy dog food to feed the thing. And so uh, I didn't have a lot of tools or anything. I'd just take him out and run him on wild birds. And, uh, he and I sort of learned how to do it together. And, um, um, yeah, without him, I don't know that I'd be the trainer or the handler that I am today. And it sort of just progressed into the next dog I got was a setter and, and I've had setters ever since. So, you know, yeah. it's funny. You mentioned that it's, and I think everybody that's had a bird dog or any kind of hunting dog that says that they had that old dog that kind of started them and then they got a dog and that dog taught them everything they needed to know about, about growing up on hunting. So, yeah. um, we've all had that dog and, and it's just, it's cool that everybody can relate on that point. Yeah. What's, so. what's kind of neat about, at least about the three of us, I think is that, uh, when I got my first setter, I don't, I think Thomas was in the same situation. I wasn't really looking for a setter. He just kind of right. showed up. And I think you were kind of the same, weren't you, Brett? You weren't really looking for a specific breed of dog, but no. a setter kind of became available at the right time. And yeah, yeah. If I'm honest, I was kind of in denial that my old dog was ever going to die. I just figured yeah. he'd he'd go on and and on. But um, of course, uh, a friend of mine, um, he had a litter of setters. And he turned me on to one, and I was resistant to it at first, just because I didn't some reason I, I had this feeling in my gut. I didn't want to do that to my old friend, you know, but right. in reality, it was probably the best thing I did for him because I was able to back off of him in his senior years and just let him hunt while it was comfortable for him. Um, and, and the setter was just a great dog. I mean, his name, I named him Jim and he, <laughs> he was just a kind of That's a big, perfect. kind of a big dopey, setter you know <laughs> wasn't a lot special about him he was just uh but he didn't do a lot wrong either and i, I really liked his temperament and um, there wasn't a lot to dislike either so that kind of got me hooked on the breed and, and i think that's uh i think that's probably happened to all of us is once you see the you know and i've hunted every yeah. dog and i've owned other breeds of dogs and i'm not sure. knocking anybody's dogs but uh, you know no. once you hunt with a setter it, you know, at least for me it was like that's it. You know, I got to, I'll, I'll hunt these kinds of dogs yeah. uh, for the rest of my days. And uh, I think there was a quote, I think you'd made a comment on, on another podcast. They asked you, well, what was it about an English setter that, that, that you like, or that why you, why do you hunt English setters? And I liked your response. Cause if you recall, I think you said, well, they please my eyes. Yeah. And I thought that's, that tells us that's it right there, yeah. you know, for all of us that have done that. Yeah. And I think all the, all the, you know, the, a good example of all of the the breeds can get the job done. Um, I think it's just a matter of what, what you like. Uh, you know, for us, I, I gotta be honest. I really like to watch, watching a pointer run too. You watch a big running snappy, fast, athletic pointer. It's hard not to admire him. Um, I've never owned one. Maybe I, maybe I should, <laughs> but, um, but th that's it. If it pleases yeah. your eyes, I, I love watching all the dogs run, but there's something flashy about that setter and he's running full speed and, and his nose brings him into the bird and he hits the brakes and it's almost like a ripple up his back and it goes straight up his tail. Boom. You know, and it, it's almost like it happens in slow motion. And at least when I watch it, it doesn't, I don't know how you, I don't know how you don't get addicted from that. You know, if to, to that, to watching that tail come up, it's just something else. Yeah. Um, that, you know, just explain that gives you that goosebumps. Yeah. Cause I think every <laughs> time I walk into a point, I get goosebumps and yeah. especially if you get in a big field where you can watch them run and, and then all of a sudden kapow. And, and yeah. I've seen dogs just roll, roll yeah. through the dirt and stand up and that tails up and blowing in the wind. And it's, 
it's like I, yeah. I think I said in the last podcast, it's it's kind of poetic. So, and uh, it's just yeah. something that you got to get used to. And a lot of people I hunt with, they a lot of short hairs. Like, how do you like watching them setters run? But it's an awful lot of hair, and I don't feel like brushing them out after the hunt. So, if that's the only excuse I can hear on these dogs, I think they're uh, they'd be pretty well good for anyone. Yeah, and, and I got to be honest, I don't blame them. That is a pain. <laughs> <laughs> we there's have no easy way around it. You no. have to, yeah. And if there's a if there's one little patch in a hundred acre field that's got yeah. couple burr in it, my dog would go right to the middle. Twice, of it. I don't know. It's, Twice. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's it's like they sniff them out, huh? Yeah. yeah. So, but you know, it's interesting yeah, because ahead. with your four dogs, mine are probably the same. Some of them are a little more tolerant to letting you comb them out than others. Are you? Oh, yeah. Have you found that to be the case? Yeah. Yeah. We've got one that's really kind of a pain, but the, you know, mo most of them are, are decent to, to work with. Uh, the one she's, she's just a little bit of a rebel in it. <laughs> anyway, that's just her nature. She's just like that. And, um, anyway, uh, we don't, fortunately we have, we hunt chuckers out here and in the chucker Hills, there aren't any burrs. And so, and, and when you're hunting Hungarian partridge, there's not a lot of burrs. And even in the grouse woods, there's, here there's not a lot of a lot of burrs only when we hunt pheasants do i have to brush them out so yeah. the, it, it, and our pheasant season isn't that long it's it's like a month long or something so um yeah so most of the time that's not that big a deal to me but uh yeah. i can certainly see how someone might really dislike that especially if they yeah. didn't there's a knack to it right you learn how to get the burrs out and yeah yeah, there is, there is, and kind of where you start and where you end up with each individual dog. And like I said, I've got some dogs that are easier than others. Of them. You know, the old guy will just lay on the tailgate and take a nap while you're yeah, done. And, right. and I've got a young little female that you'd think you were killing her, you know, every time you try to, <laughs> oh. right. so you hurt her feelings. But uh, but that's part of it. And yeah, some German short hair guys I know and, um, are always giving me the business when I'm at, you know, guiding down at the preserve and I come in and I spend, you know, they're inside having a cocktail and I'm out there cleaning up a dog and, you know, they're kind of making a big deal out of that, but you know, it's part of it. We accept it for the uh, pleasure of hunting that kind of dog, I guess. So, you know, so yeah, it. it's just part of it. I mean, now I know that you, uh, you know, you got into a lot of other things, obviously you're a hunter and you uh, different, many species of birds, but you're also into waterfowl. You do some duck hunting, and you yeah. you got into duck calling too, like professional. Yeah. How's that? How did how'd that happen? Well, I guess it's like anything. You know, you start. Actually, you know, I was about. I was kind of a wild man when I was a youngster, and and I, uh, uh, at one point, you know, I was smoking, and I, I quit smoking, blowing a duck call. I was about you know, twenty or twenty one, and um, uh, that's how I really got into duck calling and i practiced all the time and it didn't come easy to me it was super challenging so it occupied my mind a lot i'd go out and listen to ducks lay on the you know on the out here we have these public marshes and, and there's dikes that go around these impoundments that ducks sit on and i'd go out and sit and listen to the ducks and try to sound like them and i'd scare them all away and i'd get mad at myself and go practice and try to figure it out and you go know, back then we didn't have the internet and youtube and and all these things to to learn and uh, that they have today. Um, so I, uh, you know, I did my best, but eventually I got the hang of it and, and I started working ducks. And when I started calling ducks to decoys, uh, man, I bet for the first five years I was doing that, I didn't, I don't think I wanted to do anything else. I just got hooked on it. And then one of my friends said, Hey, you're, you're pretty good. You should compete. And I said, well, that'd be fun, but there's no duck calling contests around here. So I, you know, didn't think much of it. And then one day on the radio, I heard about a duck calling contest. And so I went and, and blew in it. And it was like this little rinky dink contest at a sporting goods store. And, and I won. And so I thought I was, you know, pretty big stuff. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, then the, 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 I, I found a real duck calling contest, one where, uh, people actually knew what they were doing. And I went and competed in that and I got my butt kicked. Of course, I'm stubborn. I don't quit at anything. I, I, it's, that's a, a, both a good thing and a bad thing. Ask my wife. Um, but uh, so I, I started, you know, working at it because I couldn't I couldn't win. You have to win in the duck calling world. You have to win a sanctioned contest to go to the world championship. And that was my goal was to just to get to the world championship. And it took me eight years of trying before I finally qualified. And um, yeah, you know, when you when you finally 
you accomplish something like that. It's a, it's a pretty big feeling. I met so many great people along the way. It, it's just like, it's just like NASTRA trials or field trials. The people that you meet along the way, you make friends all across the country. I have friends in every state. I mean, how cool is that? I, anyway, yeah. I never was real successful at duck calling, but I sure love the sport. Are you still doing that? Some? Are you still in uh, I, well, I retired in, in 19 and I tried to make a little comeback last February. It didn't go very well, <laughs> but um, I'm, I'm, I want to go compete again. Uh, the, the trouble I'm having is I'm trying to balance all these things and it, I'm not sure I'm going to have the time. I, I, uh, yeah, I'd like to. I really would. I would like so, to get back on the stage. So I guess and, my question about duck run. callers is, do you get too old to duck call or do you lose, what physical skills do you lose that where you can't, yeah, can't compete so, anymore? Is that a, yeah. It's, uh, I mean, lungs and diaphragm. Um, yeah. It's, it take, it actually is quite, it's more physical than you think. If yeah, you look at the guys good. that are really powerful in the sport, they're all great big guys like, you know, like Thomas, big, you know, strong guys with big cavities that they can support a lot of air um that's not to say there's not some smaller guys that have been successful too there are but uh you know you get older and you just don't have that at one point the call i was blowing it just started giving me a headache just supporting it just that much air pressure on it was just starting to give me a headache um and so i had to lighten my call up and 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 back off and, and that's taken i haven't exactly i don't know maybe that maybe that i'm even doing the wrong things you know you're always guessing and trying to figure it out but i know that i've got to blow a lighter call if i'm going to go forward i'm just i can't run that heavy call anymore i learned from buck gardner yeah. suck tape. that's how i learned how to call and then i went to arkansas and actually got in with a guy that was a big hunter yeah and we were uh, set decoys that would flooded so we were making our texas rigs longer yeah. so we were sat there and called and called and called and then he kind of like okay now you're getting it so then he gave me his old call and tuned Ooh. it up just just for me yeah he he blow it and it sound terrible but he tuned yeah. it for me and sure i still got that call and i i live right on a marsh so yeah it's fun to just go out and call back and forth but as far as the duck hunting part i don't do anymore but i do get a kick out of sitting on the porch with a yeah. cold beer at night and Calling ducks dogs. are coming back yeah. in from sure. feeding and there's guys out on the marsh and it's Oh man, it is comical to hear yeah. some guys try and, you know, they want to call like they're in a competition. And really when you're out, out yeah. on the water, you're not highballing and screaming as loud as you can on that call. You just gotta be really gentle and not normally. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's, it, it's fun. I mean, I taught, I taught a like an eight week course here for, I don't know, about 10 years or something. And I'd take like the first 20 students. I just do it for free and teach people to call. It was super fun. Um, you know, guys come in and you teach them how to tune a call and how to maintain a call. And anyway, uh, you know, I don't want to get too crazy with the duck calling, but it was, it was, uh, I mean, it's really what, what got me started and how I made a lot of the friends that, yeah. that later, um, you know, I, I hunted birds with and, and, you know, uh, some of my best friends come from that. So yeah. And, and hunting, that's, that's one thing that a lot of people can say that they have in common and, that brings a lot of friends and I did a lot of trials back when I was a younger kid and and I was talking at our last podcast that I still talk to those guys. So oh, I haven't yeah. done it for a long time, but you know, if I want to go hunting somewhere, I just have to pick up the phone and say, Hey, work point me to the right direction and they usually do. So oh, yeah. that's a big thing is and and that's kind of why we're doing this podcast too, because you know, Wade and I talk dogs and now we're pretty well best buddies now and yeah. and, and uh and getting to meet people yeah. like you and, and yeah, really get sure. into the sport. He can see whether he's going to be in 30 years. So, you know, <laughs> eat up and decrepit like I am trying to get through, uh, through cover someplace. But, uh, yeah, that's just the way it goes, like the old yeah. dog. Yeah. But, uh, you can just go to the other end and block. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I've already had, I've already heard that. I've already I had that conversation with my, you, so it hurt with so my son. So, fall, yeah, so. I got over that. When I saw how many birds were coming my way, I kind of got over that. But, yeah. Uh, anyway, it happens to all of us. But yeah. out there, Brett, I understand, uh, you know, out there in Utah and Idaho, you're pretty close to Idaho, I think, too, yeah. up there. But you were telling me that there's just all kinds of public ground out there everywhere. Just Yeah. Yeah, we've got acres. a lot of public ground, a lot of national forest, a lot of BLM land. Um, we have some state-owned trust lands that, that are open to, to public hunting. Uh, much of it is desert. 
Uh, fortunately, we have, uh, you know, uh, chuckers that live in the desert. Down south, we have gambles quail that live in the desert. Um, up north in the forest, we have, you know, ruffed grouse and, and what we, I grew up calling them blue grouse, and they are a blue grouse, but they're like the dusky strain of blue grouse or whatever. We call them dusky grouse now. Uh, and they're a great big bird the size of a pheasant or so. Uh, big, a great big male blue is, is, a big old bird and they're fun to hunt. Uh, the trouble with Utah and those birds is that they live in places that aren't flat, like flats, the opposite of what they are. And well, so, just, yeah, you, well, you're talking about the birds. I'd, I'd probably <laughs> trade the birds for the hills. I'll, I'll yeah. take the truck yeah. and I'll pick you up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. At the other end. Um, pick me up when yeah. I roll down the hill. Yeah. That's kind of... yeah. It's, it's steep and it, in places, and a lot of the places we hunt birds, especially chuckers. I mean, it, it's punishing. You, you spend a day in the chucker hills and you start to get a, a get, get a little age on you and those knees start to hurt and those hips start to hurt. And, um, I mean, it, it takes, it takes it out of bird dogs too. They're hard on bird dogs. Uh, you, you want to see a, a bird that will test a dog stamina chucker is your, is your guy. He's going to test those pads. If you don't have good tight pads and conditioned pads, uh, they'll run their pads right off. Uh, it, it's just cause of the steepness and the, and the brutal, uh, the rocks are like a rasp. They just grind a dog oh. paw they'll, they'll beat your boots up i mean if you were like dan or pronghorns or something yeah. up there you'll wear them out it's just it's just so a break it's hard to describe to someone from the midwest just how how rough that country is now, and how you hard boot your dogs it is in too? i sometimes yeah okay. if i if i can get them really if i do my conditioning right i don't have to boot them um but but somebody sometimes like us, if somebody like us came out there to hunt our dogs would probably uh yeah be booted i would guess to... you can cut you can condition them running them down a gravel road or something to you know i mean if you did enough of that you could probably maybe get away with it uh, if you're going to hunt them multiple days in a row uh, you know eventually a dog that's not used to it might it's probably going to start to break down yeah. yeah it's just it's just harsh terrain up in the grouse woods it's not as bad it's still steep but you the soil's a lot there's still rocks and stuff up there and but I don't really have too much trouble with, with dog pads up there. Now, can you, if you want to do like a, like I would call it a grand slam, if you wanted to hit all three species, could you do that in one day where you're at, or do you have oh, to yeah. do some traveling? No, nah, you could, you could hunt, you know, dusky grouse, rough grouse and chuckers all in one day for sure. Maybe you might even get lucky and find a, you know, a covey of huns or something in certain parts of the state. But, uh, you know, you, you'd have your work cut out for you because it's, Good bird years, maybe not, but you know, you got to do some, you got to cover some miles. It's not like there's a bird under every bush. I mean, they're, they're spread out. The, the bird density isn't always that high. And so you've got to really cover some ground. I think that's a, that's a mistake a lot of new guys make because I think they get up in the hills and, you know, they, we were talking earlier about, you know, the, how they, I think that the younger generation, I think they're really cued in on technology and they study, they study everything they can find on the internet and everything they can find on YouTube. And, and they know what habitat's supposed to look like a lot of times and they get into habitat and they don't find birds right away. And so they, they go home and when in reality, if they'd have stayed out there five, six, seven, eight hours, you know, they probably would have found some birds eventually and they'd learn more about what, you know, but instead they, I think they give up a little early. That sounds like me getting out, being out of shape and giving up. <laughs> yeah, well, for us, it's a lot different. I mean, we, yeah, it is. We spoke earlier because we just aren't used to those big expanses of ground. We're usually, yeah. you know, hunting uh, fence rows and, and sloughs and little edges and that kind of thing and in a little more tight kind of a, a situation. And so, uh, but I will say that the few times that I've been to South Dakota, you know, the dogs seem to know when it's time to, you know, open up and, and cover a little more ground. And so it's kind of interesting. To, and I'm sure your dogs, if you brought them to Iowa, they would know right away how to, to hunt a little tighter, you know, with the, with yeah. the, the kind of cover that we have here. So that's always, I've always, that's always kind of amazed me about these dogs, you know, that they can kind of there's, make that judgment. You know, there's no question that the good ones do. I mean, you get them out on open, like hunting sharp tails out on the open thin grouse or, grouse the thin grass up up north um you know they get out and run 
you get them in the grouse cover and, and they still run, but they, you know, they shorten up considerably, uh, out in the chucker country, they, they get out and run again. It seems like the more open the terrain is and the, the bigger they run. Uh, is that your experience too? Yeah, I'd say so. And, yeah. and, you know, a lot of the cover that I hunt, um, is pretty heavy and thick and, uh, the dogs will, they stay close. I want them going and it's like, don't be at my feet, Yeah, but get out there and, and, I watch him on the GPS and on the watch, and yeah, he's a he's one of these tech guys, you know. I, I'm I, I last time we were hunting, and the the wind was really bad, and you couldn't hear your yourself. Thanks, the wind was blowing so hard, and so that tech stuff, I would you know, he had the advantage that day on me because I I got a beeper yeah. collar, and I I couldn't when I did hear it, I didn't know what direction it was coming from. Yeah. So, but but. And I've always told him that I'm just about one level above the bell on a collar. That's where I'm at right now. And, I, and I'm really happy with that. I'm comfortable there. And so, and as long as I have a guy like him that can, you know, have that technical stuff, and, you know, I just need yeah. him to put one on my dog so he can tell me where it's at. But, but uh, yeah, the, the covers usually, uh, we're, we can get into some really thick, you know, gnarly stuff here. Yeah. Uh, we did that here this last fall. So you never know, you know, it's just kind of one of those things where, the dog's out there doing his thing and you, you know we just don't know quite you know where he's at i am a little more comfortable when, when my dog's close but that's just me so and I, but, and I can let if i get some thinner cover some open where i can see them i got a couple spots that i'm blessed to be able to hunt so yeah. and i had them you know they were out 100 120 yards the whole time but we were in birds so it wasn't like they were just going to keep getting away i was walking to points a lot and yeah unfortunately for my fat body it was 100 yards that way and 80 yards this way so i was going back and forth but um yeah and that's you know it's just well, it's part of it and the dogs and the dogs seem to really figure that out so i think if you came this way someday i think you'd be i think they would probably figure it out pretty well yeah so. pheasants are just such a different bird i mean they they don't play fair they they play by their own rules. You know, the birds, the birds that we're talking about, these cubby birds and, and grouse aren't really a cubby bird so much, but, but they do, they behave sort of like that. They're not, they're not going to run a quarter mile to get away from a, you know, out of a point or I something. Like that. I like yeah. that. They don't play fair. That's, that's pretty well <laughs> yeah. described it, I think. Right I think so too. Uh, and chuckers, you know, they, they behave pretty well for a cautious dog and all the birds out here, they don't, they don't run like that. So you can let a dog run. I mean, it's not uncommon in the flats, you know, my dogs, they might be 600 yards or something, you know, and following them with a the GPS and the chucker Hills. I don't really like them to get beyond three or 400 yards because the terrain's so harsh that, you know, if they're on point over the mountain on you, by the time you get to them, the birds still might be there, but <laughs> maybe I don't care anymore. Call the ambulance to come <laughs> right, and yeah. rescue yeah, you up the hill. I, I got uh, a water. I had to swim to my pretty much swim to my mail this year. He got out and winded one on a marsh and got out yeah. in the dry spot. And I'm like, I can't yeah. leave him there. I'm not going to call him off. So. Yeah. It was December, and I waited out to pretty much my that's belly button. Why, that's why and, I hunt with guys like you. And uh, <laughs> I left the gun on the sh on on dry land. I thought if it gets wet, I can clean it. But it's like really, I'm gonna go through all this. I don't even. By the time I get there, I'm gonna be froze. I'm not gonna care. And and you know, it was a hen, but still did it. And you still got to go to them, but maybe just leave the gun you know, <laughs> shoulder to shoulder if they're gonna hold it right. that long. But you know, right. we'll kind of keep progressing and yeah and i know we talked a little bit you know you do a lot with the youth and i kind of want to hear a little bit about that i do a lot with the youth and and try harder you know try to get the kids outdoors and just kind of explain how you know something we do versus how you guys do it out there it's just it's just nice to hear about different uh avenues yeah. people take i i do a lot of different things i mean that's probably the most important thing you can do is is take a friend hunting right it's never been um uh, and and i you know, I try to do that, uh, try to take a new guy hunting every year, sometimes multiple guys. If it's a really good bird year, it's easier to do. Uh, some the last few years, we've had some some tougher years, and so I haven't been as good at it. But um, that's that's what everybody can do if you want to introduce new people to the sport. Is just find a buddy you work with or something that's got some interest. And, and it doesn't have to be a kid even. Just, just take him hunting and show him what it good times like showing what it's like to to hunt over a point or to, to you know kick up birds over a pointing dog you'd be surprised how many people 
have never seen it. Um, the The program that I do here currently, and I've done several things in my life, but the thing I'm doing currently is is I go to FFA programs in high schools, and um, I take my dogs and I, I chat with. Uh, I chat with the kids. I take them right into the classroom. I usually take somebody from the Division of Wildlife Resources here in Utah with me or someone from a conservation organization that, that, that I work with a lot of different conservation organizations. And uh, we go right into the classroom and we talk to them about, um, you know, Pittman Robertson stuff and, and the Wildlife Restoration Act of 1937 and all that, those types of things, uh, how important hunting is for the American model of wildlife management. And uh, the whole time we're talking about that, I call it the boring, necessary stuff. Uh, the dogs are walking around the classroom just making friends, uh, you know, and they make a lot. Of, you'll watch them. They'll, and after a while, they learn how to work a classroom, too. My old dog, Tick, boy, he he finds a pretty a pretty girl in the classroom with some nice long fingernails. And you'll see him just, you know, man, she's over there scratching his ears and he's just eating it up. Um, <laughs> but, and then when we're, we're about got about a half hour left in class we go outside and i take homing pigeons and uh i actually uh you know hide the dogs and i set some pigeons uh, and we run the dogs on pigeons for them and let them actually see a dog point and the way i set it up is i i put the dogs i'll hide a bird usually i try to hide them fairly close to the kids so the kids get a great view of this and then i i bring a dog in you know 30 or 40 yards away from them and I'll put them at woe and I'll come back and, and talk to the kids about what, what they're going to see. And then I'll release the dog from there on a command and the dog will come screaming across the front of those kids. And usually they'll stick a point just like what we talked about where, you know, if I've set it up right, I mean, it's just dramatic. And then we'll bring another dog into back sometimes and we'll, you know, I'll just mix it up. It's, it's really, uh, I know that it makes an impression on them. Uh, I don't know if we make any believers out of any of them, but, but I know that they're thinking and, and every now and then I meet one of those kids later and they've got their own dog um, and they're, you know, they're into it. Uh, that's yeah, pretty cool. Yeah. 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 I like it. The funny yeah. thing about it is, is you'd be amazed at how into the pigeons they are. They, they like the pigeons as much as the, yeah, they, the they all want to pet the, the yeah, well, they, yeah, and they want to pet the pigeon and they, you know, I dizzy them. I don't use launchers. I just, I dizzy them because I think you get a more realistic, uh, well, my dogs look better on dizzy pigeons than they do mm -hmm. launcher pigeons. That's why, um, but putting them to sleep like that, I'll dizzy them and stick them in my hand and just let them sleep there. And they just, I mean, anyway, we make kind of a show out of it and, uh, that, that's what I've been doing lately for, for you know, hunter recruitment type thing. So, and I don't know what you guys do out there, but. Well, we do a lot of youth hunts. Um, mm -hmm. I work with a local, you know, there's a, a organization out of Kansas and through my local Pheasants Forever chapter, we try and get as many kids out as possible. That's perfect. And uh, I think I got, I think I got about 30 out this year. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's nice. Uh, with everything. So it's just, you know what? And I, I get a laugh because you get that first point and they're all walking in and, you know, yeah. I know the birds there and, but, uh, you know, I don't think a lot of them will hit that first bird. If they've never seen a dog on point and never seen a rooster or flesh in front of a dog, they always miss cause they look around and go, Whoa. And, and that's, you know, that's a part I get charged out of. And then, you know, there are some kids now that are in their, in their teens and their parents and they, you know, they're out of college sure. or high school now, geez, I'm getting old, but, um, <laughs> but, not. but they are. They have their own dogs and they're out hunting and yeah. and so you kind of you, you got to just watch that and and you know see okay it might not be 30 kids that you've taken hunting over a lifetime but if you can get two of the, out of them 30 that's that's pretty cool well and look at it like this i mean we don't necessarily need them to be hunters we need them to be sympathetic with hunting we need them to understand it serves a purpose and we need them to not be anti-hunting and if you accomplish that, you've done something. Now, are you able to run, are you able to, to hunt those kids on wild birds there in Iowa? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. The, uh, See, that's, that's so cool. That's awesome. So when they're, um, they get their hunter safety at 12, I think they can get it at 12 or 13 or I should know this, but, um, they actually the weekend before opening pheasant season for everything blows up, there's a youth season and they can get yeah. one bird a day. So it's Saturday and Sunday. 
gives the opportunity to the mentor, the dad, or grandpa to get them out. No other guns, just the kids. And they can get after as many wild birds as they want. They shoot at more than they get usually. Um, yeah. We have that too. Um, the trouble with, with here is, especially lately, is we don't have a lot of pheasants anyway. Um, most people don't have access to the private land that pheasants live on. Uh, having public lands, most of us, it's easier to hunt public lands, right? So, And there's not a lot of pheasants on public land. There are some. Uh, and, uh, you know, you can find them and, and get them. And, and it's sort of a, a cool thing to do. But anyway, um, the trouble is, is here, the kid might only get a shot at one bird. You might only be able to put one rooster in front of him. So it's really hard to, to get kids out on, on, on that type of hunt. And so they, a lot of times they take them to a preserve or something where they're, yeah. where they're releasing birds, but it, I don't, it's just not the same. You know, I, we have a, one of those high schools that I go to, they've, they've taken it a step further and their teacher up there is super dedicated. And one of the things that they do for their animal sciences class is they raise some chuckers and they even sell some of their chuckers to dog trainers and, and people like me. Um, I buy birds from them every year, uh, for training. And, um, they, uh, they take the, the, the bulk of the birds that they raise and they sponsor a high school chucker hunt. And so they go out and, and, and they bring in and they focus on trying to get out first time hunters. And, um, anyway, I get a bunch of guys from my, from the, the club, the Nastra club, uh, all, I try to pick dogs that are way steady, that are going to hold point a long, long time and, you know, never move. And, um, so we've got good dog work and we go up and, and guide those, those kids. And, it, and it's a similar thing to what you're doing, but it, it's, you know, it's a simulation of hunting more than it is actual hunting where you're actually, to, you're able to actually take them hunting. And I think that's pretty neat. Well, that kind of parlays us into a little bit on your book. Yeah. Um, a young guy kind of went through some troubles and, and I'll, yeah. I'll let you explain it. You wrote it, but uh, <laughs> sure. you know, as far as, <laughs> as starting out, just, you know, getting a dog yeah. and then, or finding this dog. And, yeah. Yeah. I guess the inspiration for it and how long you've been working on this project. Yeah. So, I mean, I, writing a book's a funny thing and I didn't even know that I could write a book. I, when I started that one, I, I didn't know I could, finish it i hoped i could um, but i was up in idaho and i was hunting uh on a friend's property and there was an old homestead up there and i i'd been there a bunch of times i hunted all the time uh but i had been wanting to write a book and i was trying to think of something to write about and i didn't want to just write a book about i didn't want to write a hunting story book i, I i've been writing hunting stories a bunch and i i just wanted to do something else and so i started thinking maybe i'd write fiction about people who were hunters like maybe like me and like you. So, but I couldn't come up with an exact story. Anyway, I walk into this old homestead and there was, you know, a few items remaining in this place. It's dilapidated and the roof's calf caved in and the door's hanging on a hinge. And anyway, I started thinking about, um, you know, I wonder who the last person that lived there was and I wonder what kind of time he had. And I figured it was probably in the fifties. And so, um, and I really like the fifties. I like the music from the fifties. And if I had, if I could go back in time to a hunting period, I think it would probably be the fifties. Uh, and so I started thinking about what he might've been like. And the main character of the story grew from that, from, from that. And then, you know, I, I wondered what kind of trials and tribulations he might've had and how they would compare with, with trials of, of kids of today or the trials that, that my generation had or any of us sort of universal, right? We all, no matter whether you're, you're 17 today or you're 17 in 1950, you're, some of the things that you're going through are, are the same girls, right? Uh, I mean, I mean, you guys are handsome. You never had trouble with girls at all. I'm sure, you know, I might've had some trouble with girls. I'm just going to say it. Um, <clears throat> anyway. And, and so I put him in situations that, that were, I, I, I tried to make them things that were relatable to people, to normal people. I mean, guys, we've all been through that. And I think girls relate to it sort of from the other side. And, um, you know, I always wished that I had like, like this mentor that was like really into, to trials because I always wanted to trial when I was young and I didn't really have the means. And, um, so I, I, I came up with this 
this George Knutson character. And uh, anyway, it all just kind of fell together. I mean, I, I, I bet it was like, I probably plotted the story out in my head while I was hunting that day, uh, pretty much from beginning to end. And then it was just about, I went home and I made a, like a rough outline. I mean, it looked like a kindergartner drew it in crayon, you know, it was really nothing. And, um, and then I, I went about trying to write it and realized that <laughs> I wasn't alive in the fifties and I wasn't sure if things like duct tape existed in the fifties or WD 40 or, you know, every time you write about some, the characters doing something, you got to make sure that that item existed and they would have used <laughs> that back then. You know, I, I, the amount of research I did, the internet doesn't do you much good when you're talking about pre-internet stuff. I mean, there's just not that much real world 50 stuff. So I, I did things like listen to radio cinema. I watched old movies. I listened to old music. I went to Sun Studio down in Memphis, Tennessee, when I was down at the World Duck Calling Championships one year, and and I, I wandered around learning about old music and what uh, the culture was like, you know, at that time. And then I went um, and I found. I actually searched on Facebook. And I just asked my Facebook friends. I said, "Anybody have you know some friends who are of the age that they would have been teenagers in in rural Idaho in the 50s?" and I found some and I went up and, inter and interviewed some of them. Some of them I interviewed in person and some of them I interviewed over the phone. And uh, that was the coolest part of writing the whole, the whole book. I, it, it, I tell you what, you want to get somebody, you want to really have some fun, find someone who's in their 80s and start talking to them about their teenage years and, and listen and take, take notes and, and really be into it. I mean, these people lit up. You could see there, there was a lady I, I was talking to and I could see she was, she must've been, she was probably late eighties. You could see the 16 year old girl inside her. It was plain as day. You could see it in her eyes. It, it was unbelievable. Um, it, that was probably the cooler than the writing of the book. But anyway, I used stories from some of those people that some of those, those guys told in small parts and pieces and, and they inspired, I mean, there's a bot, there's a few bond, there are a couple bonfire scenes and those bonfire scenes came from, were inspired by one of those people. Um, the, the waitress in the cafe was, was, um, she was uh, inspired by, by one of those ladies. Uh, it, it was incredible. And, you know, as I started writing it, it, it was more about having time to write than it was most of the time. It, it flowed really quite well. There was one time I wrote a chapter and a half and I got really mad and I crumpled it all up and I threw it away and started over. But other than that one time, and I was somewhere in the middle of the book and I just was going off on this stupid direction. I, I don't know what I, what I was thinking, but anyway, that was the only time I, it really just didn't, didn't flow. I mean, there was, there was times when I didn't know how to make, how to word my thoughts properly in it. And I'd bite, beat my head against the desk at night, you know, or whatever. And, but for the most part, it was, it, 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 it kind of wrote itself, um, you know, kill it, killing. Well, I don't want to give too much of it away in case people haven't read it, but anyway, go ahead. No, <laughs> I almost, I almost gave the whole story away. You know, <laughs> I was, you were mentioning the characters and I just yeah. want to say that the easiest one was probably we've all met Clyde's in our lifetime. So that absolutely. Was the, uh, yep. That was probably the, yeah. Incident, yeah. I don't say more about that. Yeah. But. I was right. rooting for him the whole time, you know, <laughs> and, uh, but I think we actually have a, yeah. a question for you. And, uh, yeah. Uh, Randy, uh, Hutchison, if I yeah. read that correctly, uh, writes, were any of the characters based on anyone, you know, Oh, uh, that's a good question. And I know Randy really well. Randy's a great guy. Randy, uh, he does all kinds of things for conservation here in Utah, uh, works on the, on the board of the Chucker and, uh, Utah Chucker and Wildlife Foundation with me. Uh, great guy. Um, yeah, I think all of the characters maybe aren't based on people I know, but they are based on experiences, collective experiences of people I have known with people I have known. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So like there's, there's uh the Clyde character, for instance, or Willie Thompson's another character that's 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 really fun. Uh Willie Thompson's a combination of two ex of experiences I had with two different guys. And they were both Willie Thompson. And uh just just 
<laughs> just re really great guys. Anyway, um, <laughs> but and and James is James is sort of a, a part of me and a and a part of parts of other people that I've known, people I grew up with. Uh, I think all the characters in the book are parts of people I've known. Uh, George Knutson's the same way. George Knutson's uh, the best parts of a lot of people I know with just a little bit of that. Um, I'm I'm wealthy and too good for you thing in him just a little bit, you know. But he he, yeah. So I, I guess heart. I guess that's it. Heart. Yeah. Oh, great heart. Yeah. Yeah. We all have a little bit of you know a little bit of something in us, right? Where none of us are perfect. So, so obviously. Um... You got another project and you're going to work yeah. on are you going to stay kind of with the hunting theme or are you going to get into some other areas or is, is that kind of where you're where so your is? i'm going to write stories about people like us doing things doing normal things that's that's my my goal um the the book i'm writing now i don't want to give too much away about it but it there's there's hunting in it. There's um, there's some duck hunting in it, and there's some bird dogs. There's a German short-haired pointer. There's a Labrador retriever, and of course, there's a, a lovely setter. Um, and these guys own this this uh, these two characters. The one character I, I'm super, uh, I'm really proud of him, and I really have a fun time writing him or writing his character. He's uh, he's suffered from a, a traumatic brain injury, and he has a PA. PTSD. He's a he's a he's a Vietnam veteran. It takes place in the in the early '90s or late '80s, and um, they uh, he he owns a piece of property that he's inherited, and then he and the next door neighbor are trying to keep this this rural lifestyle going that they've known and loved, and the urban uh, sprawl is sort of taking over. And there's a very aggressive land developer who's trying to muscle them off of their property. And the property turns out to be a little bit spe more special than anybody knows. Um, I'm not going to tell you anything more than that. But. Where does that take place? Right here in Utah on the Wasatch Utah. Front on the shores of the Great Salt Lake. Oh, super. Yeah. Wow. I'm, I'm really excited about it. It's going to, I think it's going to be pretty powerful if I can manage to write it correctly. <laughs> I just, yeah. I, I just don't, I just don't see where you, where you get the time to, to write, you know, because with all the other things that you're doing, it looks like that would really be, you really have to be organized and have your time organized. It sounds like I, to me. But. I would like to tell you I'm super organized, <laughs> but I don't feel organized. <laughs> so, you, so you have to write one that when it feels like when it's right, yeah. the feeling is yeah. right. Yeah. You could come well, out hunting with me for like two weeks, and I'll give you plenty to write about. <laughs> and I can, you'll you'll have to write you'll have to write a a second. Yeah. It's another it's a book novel. about a third, a third novel, novel about just Iowa. About, yeah. hanging out with me for a couple of weeks, but <laughs> we do have another question. Sure. Yeah. Deb writes, have you done any book signings? I have not done any live book signings. Um, I, I wouldn't mind doing it. Um, I just, uh, you know what my fear is with live book signings? <laughs> no one will show up. <laughs> <laughs> If it's kind of like having a live podcast, you know. That's where you yeah. got to have a couple some neighbors that are, <laughs> right. you know, that you, they agree to show up, you know. Help you Pay out. some friends, yeah. yeah. Pay some friends to come out. Yes, yeah. so, no, that I haven't. My, uh, oh, sorry, that was my mother with that question. Yeah. So thanks oh, for, uh, very for, good. for sticking with yeah. it. I will yeah, if, if you if you order a book from my website, as long as I've still got some, and I do have a few left, um, I will sign a book from my website for you if if, if that's something you want. I see somebody kind of roaming around behind you. So who's that? Yeah, it's all tail. There. This I is this. Is, <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's our house. It's it's snaps. Oh, okay, <laughs> snaps. Snaps. Now that's number two, yeah. right? Yeah. I three. call him the I call him the doofus. He's number three. So <laughs> number he's the three. yeah. He's number three. So and of course, so I said snaps and rocks comes over the youngest oh, dog. He's right here too. Wrong. So both the two young dogs the two old dogs they can't be bothered with nonsense like this they're no they're no, relaxing no. so yeah <laughs> mm -hmm. that's perfect that's perfect <laughs> but uh yeah so i mean um you know the book thing looks like it's really taken off for you and that's 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 great we wish you lots of uh great success with that and thanks uh, and then awesome. uh um we'll have links up i think on where people can find your it's at, through yeah. amazon of course and yeah. Yeah. You can buy through Amazon or you can, you, of course, brettwanacott.com. I have a little site set up. All it's set up for is to, to sell a few books. Uh, and I just wanted to, 
really it was it was set up to to boost sales right at the very beginning so that i could you know of course i make a little more money when i sell them myself so i just wanted to boost uh, get get a bunch sold and and i'll tell you the 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 good people from facebook who are my friends and i've interacted with some of them for you know 10 years or more some of them i've never met but we've we've interacted for years man all those people came through when that book released i could not believe it uh it was it was it just every it just seemed like everybody i knew ordered a book it, it was it was it was just i couldn't believe the love i felt from from everyone that was really special to me so it's kind of one of those things where you just don't know what to expect but you put yourself out there you know and said i'm writing this book and <clears throat> and it sounds to me from from reading a little of your mm -hmm. of your background stuff that, that the big challenge was finding somebody to to publish it and, and oh, learning yeah. that whole world that's got to be a whole separate kind that, of a that Thing was huge has to learn yeah you have this so when you write a book these are private thoughts right people don't realize this this is something that's happening very privately it's just you and the computer and it's very private and then you get done with it and you have to share it with someone and you, you, there's a part of me that felt violated as i started to i shared it with a few beta readers i had some people check it and stuff and that wasn't so bad they were friends that i trusted but when I started sending it out to to publishers to try to get it, uh, you know, published, I almost just didn't. I almost just said, you know, this is good enough. I'm going to write another book. And but my wife, she's not one to <laughs> to give up easy. Uh, she pushed me and pushed me, and and she helped me. And we we sorted it out, and we sent you know query letters out uh, to I don't know how many different publishers. A lot of them. And some of them, you know, were nice enough to send a rejection letter back and some of them didn't send anything back. And I, I sort of just made a game of it. I, I told her, we're just going to collect rejection letters. That's what we're going to do. We're going to see how many we can collect. And so we kind of played it like that. And it was a lot of work. Every publisher wants something different. They want a different format. Some people want the first page. Some people want the first chapter. Some people want the first three chapters. Some people want a synopsis. Some want a short synopsis. Some want a long synopsis. Some want it in double space. Some want it in space and a half. I mean, it's just this constant formatting battle. And I tell you, if it wasn't for for Angie and, and her help, I, I don't know that, that I would have got through it. But eventually, uh, Touchpoint Press sent me a, a note back and said, we're very interested. And, and I was... I thought it was a scam because I'd had a couple come back that were that were scams. So, I, but I looked into it and it was legit. And so, you, so you didn't pass out or anything when you opened the letter then? No. Well, it was an email. You know, everything's oh, email. emails email. now. Yeah, of course, of course. It, 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 yeah. So I I opened it and I I was you know I showed Angie and I said I I think it's legit and you know we read it and and it was and so I you know I signed the deal and and then the publishing thing started and that was a whole new deal right it, it, <laughs> you think okay i got published now we're going to edit this book and it's going to go to market well what it really is is you wait and so like a long time went by like i i want to say a year but maybe it wasn't quite a year but it seemed like forever i don't know how long it was uh and then i finally got a note from a uh, an editor who, who was ready to go to work and and then of course i had to i had to hump to get it edited and stay up at night and uh you know i i had like a week to edit it to, to go do the first edit and send it back and then you know it went back and forth and we argued and fought and it was really fun and anyway but then it's another year before it goes to market oh wow so and anyway. and and i should point out that just because you don't have setters mm. doesn't mean this book isn't going to fit for you That's right. because i, I mean yeah. you could replace that with any dog but any relationship you had especially with with the james character with starting yeah. out young and then growing you know that those those two grew old together so um yeah. without giving too much away but right that's why, yeah you know that's why we're here dogs bring everybody together and he you know he was a no and, nobody knew who he was and then here he is out doing his thing and yeah i tried really hard to write this book not just for i knew dog people i knew guys like you and me who were gonna you know, well, I hoped <laughs> that they would like it, but I knew if anybody liked it, it'd be you and, and guys like me. Um, but I, I tried to write it in such a way that someone who doesn't know anything about bird dogs, but just likes dogs could read it and, and, and like the story. Sort of like, I'm not a fly fisherman. 
there's a lot of people here that probably want to beat me up right now. I'm not a fly fisherman, but I loved, you know, a river runs through it. I thought, what, what, a, what an amazing story that was. That's actually one of my favorite movies. So. Yeah. And I tried to, I tried to write it with that in mind that, that, and I, one of my beta readers was from inner city, Los Angeles. And she, she was all in. She'd never seen a bird dog. Doesn't know anything about bird dogs other than pictures of mine. Uh, so that's why, that's why I chose her. And anyway, it was. Looks like we've got somebody else with a question. Two no questions. Oh, Good. Here we go. Zach uh -oh. Byers writes, what would you say would be the biggest difference in hunting styles between a setter and say a German short hair? Well, the setters are always on point and the short hairs are always backing. <laughs> No, I'm kidding. No, I'm kidding, man. Shot I, well, one I across love, the bow. I love shot. short hairs, and I've had, I've had, uh, I've, I've been beat up in trials by short hairs many oh, times. Yeah. Yeah. And some of my best friends run short hairs. Um, you make that comment lovingly. <laughs> yeah, yes. I, yeah, exactly. I think short hairs, and and you guys are going to kill me for this, but I think short hairs probably make a better pheasant dog. I think they trail birds really well naturally. They they have that that natural trailing instinct, and they they like to put their nose down a little bit. Setters like to run with their nose up, and and we like them to run with their head up. And 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 so, in my experience, um, that's one of the differences. I do think that short hairs are a tougher dog. I think they can take uh, some some of the. I watch you know the chucker heels out here. We we discussed how tough they can be. I think that the short hairs out here really take well to the to the chucker hills and 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 are tough enough to handle it. They have a tough spirit. Um, setters tend to have a little bit more of a soft disposition, in my experience. True. My yep. setters are are, are very, very soft. I think if you're a heavy handler, you're probably better off with a short hair. Uh, more than it, it, a setter needs a kind hand and a soft touch. Yep. Um, well, it's like we have another question here. Okay. Chad Chase writes, are you working on another book currently, which we spoke about a little bit earlier, a little bit. Mm -hmm. or do you write any other content that we could also enjoy? So, I, I mean, there's some old stuff that I, that I wrote a while back. I, I haven't really done, I've been focusing on writing novels, so I haven't written a lot of, uh, you can follow me on social media. Uh, I, I post a lot of little short stories that are, are really nothing more than just, you know, a hunt, little hunting story or something. There is a blog, it's called uh, setter tails and matter mallard curls of all things which is um and it, it's still out there uh it, it's older writings it's it's mostly unedited uh but but you know those are the stories that that i started with and they're all just hunting stories about hunting chuckers or hunting grouse or uh, describing uh, you know a day with a dog that was special to me or, or an old dog that's no longer with us or something like that yeah and I think it's sometimes that's better content when it's just raw and you just put it down and, and somebody can go in and read it. And I've yeah. thought about doing that. I just never got the ambition, but, um, but yeah, I wish I was still doing it. it. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. We, like I said, we, we really appreciate you putting the time in and coming on with pleasure. us and bearing with us as we work out this new technology and we try to, uh, hey. use this guest, uh, scenario for the first time and so you needed to we needed a guinea pig and i guess you were kind of that tonight <laughs> but uh i i really i was really captivated by some of the the, the things we talked about tonight and and uh, a lot of that really struck close to home for me of course and uh but uh and uh, so yeah great i hope you enjoyed it like we did thanks it was a lot of fun um i hope you guys like the book and and you know brettwanacott.com if you want to sign one yep and we're gonna have all your all your links and everything on on the page and in all of our Spotify's, YouTube's, everything. So all the links will be on the descriptions of the videos. And and once again, Brett, we uh, appreciate it and hope we can get you to come out to Iowa one of these falls and get after some big roosters. That sounds great. I love hunting pheasants. All righty. Thanks, Brett. Thank you.